Oh, hello. I'm award-winning science communicator and the Netflix adaptation of Thor, Kyle Hill. Before we get into black hole machines today, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, my new favorite thing to do in my browser aside from complain about stuff on the internet, Prosperous Universe. Imagine, you are the CEO of your own spacefaring company after all life on Earth is destroyed. Humanity struggled for decades to make a new foothold in the universe, and now you, along with other real players, will build a galactic economy together. Do you deliver titanium to critical industries across the void, or do you make the ships that transport it? Do you make an alliance with another real player to deliver medical supplies, or do you wait until disaster occurs to sell your shares? Fairness, no grind, and realism are the name of the game when it comes to this free-to-play, browser-based sci-fi economy simulator. And the name of the game is Prosperous Universe. If you want to check it out, go down into the description or go to prosperousuniverse.com, sign up, check out how awesome it is. Please trade me some Helium-3. We can get to today's episode now, but I really need that. Everything here is powered by it. In 1963, a mathematician out of New Zealand named Roy Kerr discovered an exact solution to Einstein's equations of general relativity, a solution that fully described the geometry of a spinning black hole, celestial bodies much weirder than their more stationary counterparts. Space and time act so funky around these bodies, in fact, that in theory, a sufficiently advanced human civilization could utilize this weird space-time and siphon energy from it, powering their, I don't know, jetpacks and flying cars and whatnot, but how could you make a black hole machine? Aria, take us in. If we spend any more time out here, the time dilation's gonna make us like 50 years younger than the rest. They're all gonna look gross when we get back. Now entering the facility. One of the most dramatic scientific insights in human history was Albert Einstein's realization that space is not quite as empty as it seems. Rather, it has an underlying structure to it, a somethingness of fourth dimensionality that we now call space-time. Space-time affects and is affected by every object and particle in the universe. For example, objects within this space-time follow its curvature to know how to move and how to accelerate, and those same objects create that curvature through their influence. Now, in everyday life, you don't notice this underlying structure, but if you start moving fast enough, or you get near something so incredibly massive enough, like a black hole, that's when things start to get weird, like science weird. The weird is kind of weird. The geeky among you may already know the basic structure of a non-rotating black hole and what happens when so much mass is in such a small space that nothing can escape. Time slows down, objects can be stretched into molecular spaghetti. It's literally a wound in the universe where space-time is falling faster than light in all directions. Whoa. The point of no return is known as the event horizon. The actual thing, not like the movie that's not as good as you remember, which hides the physics-breaking singularity from any attempt to see it. This is a very simplified look at your classic black hole, one that isn't moving. But like a figure skater that pulls her arms in during a spin to spin faster, a star that's collapsing to become a black hole can be spinning in the first place. So when all that mass comes together in that small space, you can end up with a black hole that is spinning at an unbelievable and unimaginable rate, so quickly in fact, that it can bring space-time itself along with it. Aria, prepare me the bowl of science, honey, and meet me outside in your drone. You want me to prepare the what? What? You don't think I can explain spinning black holes with just a, a bowl of honey? I can, ye of little faith, that I guess I program myself, so it's my fault. I'll see you outside. Recall that we said that space-time has an underlying structure to it, a somethingness that affects and is affected by objects and what they do within this medium. Well, today we're going to represent that somethingness and what it does around spinning black holes with a big bowl of honey and a tennis ball. It works. 
Okay, so obviously the black hole here is our tennis ball. The honey will stand in as our space time. And now I will add some food coloring to this honey to represent two different objects at two different distances from this spinning black hole. Now we're gonna actually spin it and watch what happens. See how one object is moved around the spinning black hole and the other is not just through the black hole's influence? This is an area around our spinning black hole where space-time is being literally dragged. Yes, drag it. <laughs> drag, drag space-time. Oh, man. <laughs> Guess what? Our little demonstration here actually occurs in the wider universe. When space-time structure encounters the near light speed spin of a rotating black hole, it can be dragged around it, actually spun like our honey here in what's called frame dragging or frame of reference dragging. And it occurs in an area outside of the event horizon called the ergosphere. And now that you have some of that physics in your head and these terms, we can start thinking about making a black hole machine. Aria, take us back with your drone body. Okay, so we're pretty close to actually conceptualizing a black hole machine in our minds. But first, we just need a little bit more spinning black hole physics. But if you stay with me, you'll know more than 99% of the human population does about black holes. And you can brag about that. Feel free to brag about that. If you're close enough to a spinning black hole to be in the area where space itself is dragging, an outside observer like you looking at me is going to see me move. If the space-time here isn't moving very fast, in theory I could move in this space-time in the opposite direction against the flow to make myself appear as though I were stationary. But if the space-time were dragging along at the speed of light, which it can outside of spinning black holes, then there's no way I could ever appear stationary, because nothing with mass like myself can move at or beyond that speed. The exact distance from the center of a spinning black hole at which it is impossible to appear stationary to outside observers is the start of the ergosphere we mentioned before and simulated with honey. And this is where the weird stuff I keep mentioning happens. Because space-time at the ergosphere is literally moving at light speed, even something moving at the speed of light, like a photon, has to immediately change paths in this flowing space-time encounter. In this way, the ergosphere is kind of like the event horizon, but for movement. Perhaps even weirder than this is that because space-time itself, the underlying structure of the universe itself is moving, objects falling into a black hole in this way can have a negative energy. It sounds like science fiction, but it's real. I mean, look, you're looking at a graph. That means it's real. Graphs are the ultimate proof of anything. Now, finally, we know everything that we need to know to make a black hole machine, and you should never again feel nervous at a cocktail party. Just bring up all the black hole physics you know now, I'm sure it will go over great. Now, because both energy and momentum are still conserved, even in this weird spinning space-time, there is a situation in which, which was first proposed by Sir Roger Penrose in 1969, nice, an object could enter an ergosphere and then leave with more energy than it started with. So for example, consider a mass that could separate itself into two halves with like a rocket or an explosion or something like that. The mass enters the ergosphere and then at a certain point it detaches. One half spirals down into the event horizon with negative energy and the other half follows a specific trajectory out of the ergosphere with more energy than it entered with. This is because since momentum and energy are still conserved, the black hole got some negative energy in this exchange, so to equal everything out, the leaving piece needs to have more energy. This 
is the Penrose process, and this is how you steal energy from a spinning black hole. And this is also why the ergosphere is called the ergosphere. Ergo is Greek for work, the work sphere. And whenever a system can do work on an object, that's something that scientists and engineers can take advantage of. Are we just not going to talk about that you actually have drones <laughs> No, that's what, that's fine. The drones aren't gonna be coming for all of them. Prob today, probably. It's fine. Just last year, over 50 years since Sir Roger Penrose first proposed stealing energy from a spinning black hole, a paper was published experimentally verifying the Penrose process. So we know this is really possible. Yes, there are some theoretical limits on how much a single particle can steal from a black hole in this way based on a percentage of its rest mass and equations and blah, 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 blah. But it means that everything we've talked about today, it is an engineering problem to power an advanced human civilization with a black hole, not a theoretical one. That's amazing. Think of in the far, far future some halo-like ring structures around a spinning black hole that lowered masses down into it to spin electrical turbines and get energy, or an entire civilization living on the outside of a black hole, and an arcology that threw down its waste mass into the black hole and they would come back up and spin turbines and again get electricity or something, and th there's even more complicated designs than this, but the idea is the same. Powering a human civilization on a spinning black hole is something that we could really do if we don't destroy ourselves in like the next 50 years, and it would still make for a pretty prosperous universe. Ha ha, I see what you did there. Oh, ho, ho, brought it back around. Now exiting the facility. Thank you so much to the very nerdy staff at the facility for their direct and substantial support in the creation of this here video. Today especially, I want to recognize research assistant Quad Phonic and visiting scholar Jeremy Alva. If you want to join the facility, if you want to drape on a silky white lab coat, if you want to talk with me every day on Discord, get behind the scenes photos, see videos early, get monthly private live streams with me, not like that. You can go to patreon.com slash kylehill to join the facility today. And hey, if you support us just enough, get your name on Aria here each and every video. And as you can see, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of you. So I have no idea how I'm gonna pass this. Again, thanks to Prosperous Universe for sponsoring today's episode. It's a very cool game, great time sync, and you get to learn a little bit of stuff. And before you go down into the comments, I know that Kurzgesagt, or how, whatever you say it, already did a video like this. There can be more than one thing about things. Interesting to know that the Penrose process that we were discussing today actually appeared on the big screen. They used it in Interstellar to fling themselves around Gargantua. It, it's almost like the advisors and script supervisors for that movie were really smart. In fact, one of them just won a Nobel Prize. One of the most scientifically interesting movies of all time, except for the what if gravity was love part. Okay, Catwoman, okay. Thanks for watching.